have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Corinthians 5.20. And uh, I want to I give you something that you can use today that I believe is a commissioning from the Lord in the season that we're living in. 2 Corinthians 5.20. So, one of the things that I think is important for us to realize is this, is that one of the indictments against the church in general over the last few years is that um, I think that the pandemic exposed a lot. And I think that uh, in a lot of respects, we were, and I'm, I'm not just talking about Belrose, but I'm talking about church in general. I think we lost sight of the goal. I think we were more driven by attendance than we were about the health of people. I think we were more driven about the spectacle of church rather than the Holy Spirit that is the one that can truly change hearts. And I think it's somewhere along the, le the way we lost our understanding of what it means to be a believer. And, and the fact of the matter is, is this, is that attenders, you know, the Bible says when your house is built on a solid foundation, right, of Jesus Christ, when the rains and the storms come, the house will still be standing. But when your foundation is built on the sand and, and, and when the rains come, the same rains come. Remember, it rains on the just and the unjust. The rains will come. But those whose foundation is not built on the Lord Jesus Christ, that, that house will not stand. And, and that's exactly what happened over the last few years is that disciples stay, but attenders will scatter when the rains come. And I think one of the things that we've forgotten is that when you come to Jesus, it's not just so that you can have the freedom of, of, uh, that comes when, you're, when the blood's applied to your life, where you can be free of sin. I'm grateful for that, but that should compel you to something. It should compel you to be active. It should compel you to articulate the goodness of God to those who you've been called to serve. And, and 2 Corinthians 5.20 says this. It says, let's read it together. 2 Corinthians 5.20. It says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, Don, I love you, baby, but just hold on the piano for a second because I want to hear the voices. You see, I'm asking you to read something that God is commissioning you to do. I'm going to ask you to listen to it because, you see, the only scripture you obey is the one that's truly resonated in your heart. And this is what Jesus has said for you. So I want you to read it again, and I want you to read with understanding. Wait a minute. This is not talking about somebody else. This is not a lesson. This is talking about me. So let's read it together. Come on. Let's say it. Let's say, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Here's the deal. Jesus is making his appeal through you. And that's why he's equipped you with the Holy Spirit. Because he understood if he was going to make his appeal through you, you would need the intelligence of the Holy Spirit and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit so that the message would resonate. The reality is, is that none of you were changed by a person's argument. Every one of you were impacted by the Holy Spirit that somebody spoke a word. Somebody said something to you about Jesus, and what you responded to was not that person or their flashiness. You didn't respond to the lights in the service. You didn't respond to the worship team or the power of the subwoofer. You responded whether you were saved in a small church with a million tambourines or you got saved in, 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 in uh, elevation. You responded to the power of the Holy Spirit. And it was the message that was spoken through an ambassador, whether it be in a large church service or it be in somebody's home or, some, or in a workplace where you bowed your heart and you prayed to Jesus. You were compelled because you heard the message and it was quantified and qualified by the Holy Spirit. And you sensed the Holy Spirit and you were drawn in like a laser beam. Amen. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, how will they hear unless someone is sent and preaches? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And I'm telling you, if you turn on the news, you see a world that is deeply divided. If you turn on the news, there are people who are rejoicing today about a decision and people who are devastated today about a decision. And guess what? Both people need a message from the Holy Spirit. And you have been called 
to be an agent of heaven and to be an agent of change that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Because if you don't go, they won't hear. If you don't speak, they'll never know. And if we don't get out of here and do what God has called us to do, this world will never change. Why would he give you the precious gift of the Holy Spirit if it wasn't for a purpose? And it is not just to keep you happy and at peace. It is to be used for kingdom purposes in ministry of which all of us are called to. And today we're going to talk about it. Amen? Because let me ask you a question. Do those empty seats bother you? Those are people that can, there's people that can fill them. Stop waiting for the people who used to go here. Start going fishing for some new ones. But what will get the fish is not our clever schemes or our marketing campaigns, even our lights and smoke, although we will have pyro one day. It's my dream. It's going to be all of us going out in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And today I want to talk to you about how you can do that. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you so much. I'm humbled, Lord, that you know who I am, what I've done, and where I've been, and yet you still want to use me. And God, I pray everyone would be, realize that for themselves, too, because you know who they are, what they've done, where they've been, and you still want to use them. And Father, you're going to use me, Lord, today to just speak a word, and I just pray I wouldn't get in the way. I pray, God, that you speak through me and that, Lord, your people would hear from you and they would be motivated by you and changed by your Holy Spirit. I thank you that there would be a passion that you, you just well up inside of them, that they will be so enamored with you that they will do whatever you say. They will go wherever you go and they will trust you undoubtedly for everything in their life. We need you, Jesus. And here we are in this church, privileged, Lord, to have a building and, and a, a video ministry. And the world is so divided and so hurting right now. We can't keep silent anymore. You've called us to go to the highways and byways and bring hope to people in Jesus' name. And I pray that you would not only motivate us, but you would equip us today. And we just thank you for your word, your life-changing word. Let it be your word and only your word that comes forward today in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. So I want you to think about when you were saved, okay? My journey to Christ happened very interestingly. When I was young, my mother used to pray this prayer with me. And my mother, you know, wasn't necessarily serving the Lord, but she, was, she had a very tender heart for the Lord. Both my mom and dad, I believe, were searching long before they even came to Christ. And although they lived life on their own terms, there was a time where I remember they would watch, like, Jimmy Swaggart on the television. Um, they would watch the 700 Club every once in a while. And my mother would pray this prayer with me. And <laughs> it's, it's a very horrific prayer for a young person to pray. But like, you guys have prayed it, right? Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. I mean, that's like devastating for a child. Thank God I didn't realize what I was praying. But nonetheless, she was teaching me that God heard prayers. We weren't necessarily saved. My mother and father were hungry for the Lord. They, they were being ministered to over the course of years by, by many people. But my mother would pray that prayer with me. And I remember one night, I was really scared because my father worked nights. And we lived in Middle Village, Queens, and I was scared because of General Zod from Superman 2. You guys know General Zod, the villain from Superman 2? And, and Metropolis looked a lot like New York City, and we lived in Middle Village, which is very close to New York City. And so I remember General Zod landing in the planet Houston in the day, but at night, he was in New York City running havoc, fighting Superman in the middle of the city, Gotham. And it wasn't, it wasn't Gotham, no. Uh, Metropolis is Superman. Gotham is Batman. I'm sorry. Pastor Kevin is Bateman, so he lives in Gotham. But uh, 
I remember being so scared because it was nighttime, and that's when General Zod came, comes to Manhattan, and he destroys it, and I, just, I could just see General Zod s flying through my window, step and needle before Zod, you know, the whole thing. I remember I was so scared, and my mother, God bless her, you know, she had to deal with three boys while my father was at work, you know, police officer and all that stuff, and there's a reason my mother had to bring a frying pan to church. There's a reason why my mother threatened to call the home for disobedient children. There's a reason my mother had to use the tactics that, because we were idiots. We were knuckleheads. And so my mother was probably at that point where she was tired of, Mom, I don't want to go to bed. And so, like, Mom wasn't there to pray with me. She's probably a little frustrated that night. And I remember just being up at night, and I, and I prayed. I said, Lord, I'm scared. I, 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 know you, I know you're out there. I just had such a childlike faith. It was amazing. Nobody really told me about Jesus. You know, I mean, I, I had a cultural knowledge of Jesus. We went to church. You know, you had the saints with the candles, the whole thing. You know, and, but I remember praying that night, and I remember something significant came over me. I remember I had such a peace that night. I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. I didn't know it, but I felt it. One of the fruits of the Spirit is peace. And I had peace that couldn't be shaken. General Zod could have flown to my room and said, step and kneel before Zod. And I'd be like, cool. Jesus is bigger than you. I, I, if you. How many people, you've ever been mortified and terrified as a kid? And you know that's a real feeling. You have those nightmares, you wake up. Come on, how, does anybody remember? Are you alive today? Do me this favor. Just check the pulse. But how many people remember when you were, when you were afraid as a kid, it was real? It felt like you were just afraid of things that were illogical that to your old self. But you just were you, were, you were paralyzed by that. And I remember praying to God and having an encounter with the Holy Spirit. I remember that same feeling when I came to Jesus. I remember that the preacher was good, but I can't tell you what the preacher preached. I remember the atmosphere was lit. I was at a, I was at a youth rally, and, and it was in Shirley Assembly of God. And I got saved a lot of times when I was young because back in the 80s, the pastors always preached about the rapture and being left behind. So I can't exactly tell you the date of my salvation, but I know I got saved 75 times at the age of 13 at various places. <laughs> and I remember being at a youth rally, and it wasn't because it was cool and, and the youth were there. I just remember going to Shirley Assembly of God and, 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 and coming down to the altar. I remember my little church in, in St. James. If we had 50 people, we were in revival. And I remember it wasn't because of the worship. Because we had a, a, a woman on piano, and we had a guy uh, who sang, and we had 17 tambourines released in the atmosphere. Our musicians played in the front row. And how many people remember in the 80s, drums were of the devil? So it wasn't because we had the hippest music. But there was something about the presence of God that drew me in. And it was the Holy Spirit that changed my heart. Now, I told you my story, but what's your story? Did you get saved because of the light show? Did you get saved because somebody debated Christ so eloquently that you finally gave up your reservations? What I found is usually you trust God and you respond to his spirit. And then as you go through sanctification, as you go through your walk, then you start to study the word of God. And the word of God backs up what you've experienced. Am I right? But what, what brought you to Jesus was not somebody's compelling argument or even the, the atmosphere, although the atmosphere does help, although the preaching does help. Ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit that changed your heart. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. That if you've been deputized and commissioned, the Bible says that you are called. The Bible says go into all the world and make disciples. And you have been called to make disciples. That's it. The purpose of a Christian is not to have a house. It's not to have vacations. It's, that's not your primary purpose. Now listen, it's a blessing to have a house. It's a blessing to go on vacation. I'm going on a good one coming up. I'm going to Florida. I'm changing my name. I'm throwing away my cell phone. I'm taking on a new identity. And I'm not talking to anybody for four weeks. Praise God. I thank God for that vacation. I thank God for the blessings. I thank God I have a car to drive. But anything that comes before your, your identity in Christ and your mission for him is idolatry. And he's jealous of anything. That's why the Bible says, are you with me? Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. I can tell you this. I have been blessed more than I deserve because I've made serving God my life. It hasn't been perfect. It hasn't been easy. 
There have been some tests along the way. But, man, if I tried this on my own strength, I'd have half of the stuff I have today. I wouldn't be as blessed as I am today. But, God, since I decided to give him my life and serve him with my life, I'm not talking about following him to be a pastor. I'm talking about whether I'm a pastor or a hot dog salesman on the side of the Long Island Expressway. My life has been blessed because I made Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. And I've been busy about his business. And that's not a pastor thing. That's a kingdom thing, and that's a church thing. You see, we've grown accustomed to the lie that, well, the pastors are supposed to do the preaching, and we're supposed to come and do the consuming, and then we all go to the diner, and then we live our lives, and then we come back on Sunday. Lie number one of the enemies that your life has to be compartmentalized. I'm going to tell you something. You come to this church to be fed so that you can use the spiritual nourishment in the world to minister to people. If you're continually feeding yourself, but you're not burning what you've been fed, then you become a lazy Christian that eventually will leave this church because you're not being fed. But the Christians that survive and thrive, the disciples, disciples make disciples. Disciples make disciples. You have to get it in your mind that you have to be passionate about reproducing who you are in somebody else for the glory of God. You should be looking to see people come to Jesus, and you should be looking to see people replicated to serve Jesus and to be passionate about his call. And if we're not doing that, we're not on mission, and we will never be blessed as a church, and we can't be blessed as a family. Because anything that comes before the mission of Christ is idolatry. And so what Jesus has done is that when you accepted him as Lord and Savior, he gave you his Holy Spirit. Now, 1 Corinthians 2.9. You ready? However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what the human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things, listen to this now, God has revealed to us by his spirit. Did you catch that? The blessings of God are revealed by his spirit. The direction of God is revealed by his spirit. The word of God is illuminated and revealed by his spirit. There is nothing in your life that is not revealed by the spirit. You cannot sense the will of God for your life. You cannot sense the will of God for a church. You cannot sense the will of God for your marriage. You cannot sense the will of God for your children. You cannot do a thing without the spirit. It is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Nothing happens without the revelation the direction and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus gave you the Holy Spirit. And so in Acts chapter 2, verses 4 through 13, I want you to turn there with me. Let me know when you're there. Acts chapter 2, verses 4 through 13. This is Jesus in Acts chapter 1. Right? If you go back in Acts chapter 1, you'll see that he ascends into heaven. Before he ascends into heaven, there's a few things he says. Matthew 28, 19, go into all the world and make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He didn't say go and build churches. He didn't say go and have your homes. He didn't say go and make Christian bookstores and go on Amazon to make plates and to have crucifixes all over your house or whatever the case is. He said go and make disciples. Be about your father's business. And then he said this, okay, I've told you to make disciples. Now in Acts 1, chapter 4, turn there, I'm going to turn, I'm going to turn there in my Bible so this way I don't misquote it. But in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, Acts is next to Genesis. You guys okay? All right. You listening? All right. Good. You can respond. Amens are okay. Let me know you're alive. Acts chapter 1 verse 4. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Command. What does the command mean? He did say, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this suggestion. (laughs) It didn't say... 
One day while he was eating with them, he asked them to do him a favor. Hey, while I'm gone, can you watch the cat? No. One occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Okay? Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised you, which you have heard me speak about. Verse 5, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And verse 8, let's read it together. Acts 1, 8. All right. Acts 1, 8. Praise the Lord. Let's read it together. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You'll be my witnesses. So what does witness mean? You will be my ambassador. You will be the people who will testify of my power, of who I am, to Jerusalem, Judea, and the other most parts of the earth. Now, looking at the book of Acts, I'm sorry to bar, bore you with the history lesson, but you got to know what the Bible says, okay? Listen, I, I can give you comedy, but we've all found out that's not working right now. So I'm just going to give it to you straight. In the book of Acts, the Roman Empire was the predominant government of the time. The Roman Empire acknowledged the Jewish religion as official, but they saw Christianity as a threat. Can I ask you something? What do the governments of this world see Christianity as? A threat. Isn't it good to know that no matter what the government says, we will still be okay? Because we have the real thing. And when you have the real thing, it will outlast whatever threat the world can throw at it for over 2,000 years and still be standing. I would do a real mic drop, but I know how much this costs, so I'm not. Now, he says, you will receive power, right, when the Holy Ghost comes upon you so that you can be my witnesses. So the very Holy Spirit that Jesus gave to you at salvation was not so that you can have just such a blessed life, like, and not use that blessing to bless others. You understand what I'm saying? There's an extreme of prosperity preaching that says, well, God is my means to get the car, the house, the promotion. But I will ask you this question. All these things that you're praying for, all these things that you're believing for, all this favor and promotion that you want, what are you going to do with it? Why do you want it? Do you want it to be more comfortable and secure? Because, because people want more money so that they can be more secure. But how many people know money can't secure you if God's not your security? Everybody wants the healing because they're afraid to die. But if you don't have Jesus as the security of your life, you have the assurance of heaven. Amen. So listen, I don't want to die either. At least Rachel and I can go together so I know I'll be guaranteed she'll never get remarried. But... Do you understand what I'm saying? Why do you want what you ask for? Why do you want the healing? Why do you want the house? Why do you want the job? I, I understand you have a, listen, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a man. So you, you all agree, right? Come on. <laughs> I'm a man. I'm a father. I'm a husband. So I have a natural desire to be a provider. I have something in, ingrained in me that says, I, I got to take care of my family. I got to make sure there's food on the table. But if I become the sole provider of my family and I, I circumvent God being the provider of my family, do you understand what I'm saying? My need to provide has become my God. So when I ask God for provision, what am I going to do with the provision? If I ask God for a house, what am I going to do with the house? And we need to understand that every blessing we ask from God, we're blessed to be a blessing. So if I do get a house, I'm going to use it for your glory. I'm going to host a Bible study in it. I'm going to, I'm going to, have, I'm going to host people. I'm going to practice biblical hospitality. I'm going to use it for your glory. I'm going to build relationships. If I do have a car, I'll pick somebody up who doesn't come to church. 
You understand what I'm saying? If I'm asking God for things, yes, he wants you to enjoy them. Yes, he wants you to have them. Yes, he wants you to be blessed by them. But if they come before his purpose in your life, which is to make disciples and to be under the power of the Holy Spirit, to be his ambassador, then, friends, it's, it's sinking you to the bottom of the ocean like a weight rather than use. You understand what I'm saying? Anything that comes before God and his purposes is an idol. And in the book of Acts, we see that Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and the uttermost parts of the earth. So how many people know that, like, um, the church is not the most popular kids on the block? The world is telling us not to preach Jesus, that we can't pray, that you can, you can worship as long as you keep it on Sunday. Come on, do you even sense that in your workplaces? Like, yeah, you can go to church on Sunday, but don't bring any of that Jesus into the office. And we have fallen victim. You see, when you are living by the flesh and you look at the world as your barometer for what's acceptable, you won't preach Jesus. You'll be put back in the closet and you won't preach Jesus because you'll feel, if I preach Jesus at work, I'll be fired. If I preach Jesus, I'll, I'll, I'll offend somebody. If I pray for somebody, I'll offend somebody. But I'm going to tell you something. The world and the institutions are telling us, keep your Jesus at home. But I'm going to tell you, in those institutions, there are people that will say yes to you praying for them. There are people that will say yes to you reading a scripture over their life. There are people that will say yes to you coming over to their house and ministering to them. Although the, the institutions are saying no, the people who work in those institutions have never been more hungry and open for the gospel than they are now. And when you walk by the Spirit, you don't listen to what people say on the surface, you listen to what the Spirit says, and you follow the Spirit, because that's how Peter went to Cornelius' house. God told him to go to a Gentile's house to preach the gospel to him. He came in a vision, and Peter was obedient to the revelation of the Holy Spirit, and he went to a person who he was juxtaposed to, who was nothing like him, and he went, and he preached, and his whole household got saved, and they got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he was obedient to the Spirit in a time where he could have been thrown in jail, where what he was doing was considered a threat to the government. Cornelius was a government official, and by virtue of him even being in that house, he could have been thrown in prison and flogged. But when the Spirit says go, he also sends warring angels to protect you. He prepares a table before you within the presence of your enemies. And so we see Peter... In Acts chapter 2, verses 4 through 13, in the beginning, 1 through 3, the Holy Spirit falls in the upper room. They all begin to speak in tongues. And this is what happens. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment. Because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us has heard them in our own native language? Do you know what happens? You know what true Pentecost is? It's when everyone hears the gospel in their own language. When you are moving in the power of the Holy Spirit, when you are moving in the anointing of the Holy Spirit, when you are working in the discernment of the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding you, your words will not fall on deaf ears. Because how many people know you can give a Bible verse, you can pray for somebody, but if the Spirit hasn't told you to give that Bible verse, if the Spirit hasn't told you to pray, if the Spirit hasn't prompted in your heart to go, you're going in vain. But when you go in the Spirit, and you're empowered by the Spirit, it's not your words that change people. It's the Spirit that changes people. And the Bible says that that day, everybody heard the gospel in their own language. The Parthians, the Medes, the Elamites, the residents of Mesopotamia and Mesopiqua, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Hollis, Asia, Phrygia, Queens Village, Pamphylia, Egypt, Garden City, Libya, near Cyrene, 
Visitors came from Rome. You see, because on the day of Pentecost, this is the, this is the issue. On the day of Pentecost, it was a Jewish feast. They don't call it the day of Pentecost because of the Holy Spirit. They call it the day of Pentecost because it was an Old Testament feast, and everybody came from the known world all around Jerusalem. So while this commotion was breaking up in the upper room and everybody began to speak in tongues, everyone from the known world was there. It would be like in the middle of Times Square right now. If we were to go to the middle of Times Square right now and the Holy Spirit would fall and there would be people from Libya and Afghanistan and Iraq and Iran. Come on now. And all these places all over the world. And they were in, 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 in Times Square. And all of a sudden, we all began to speak in tongues. And every one of the people in Times Square would hear the gospel preached in their own language. And the people who were speaking had no idea what they were saying. That's how awesome the power of the Holy Spirit is. It defies our wisdom. It's not based on our understanding. It's on time all the time. It is 100% infallible. It is powerful, and it's what we need. So here's the deal. Our Facebook posts, if not inspired by the Holy Spirit, will not change a thing. Our regurgitating of other people's quotes are not going to change a thing unless the Spirit gives you permission to say that. I'm going to tell you something. We have to be litigious, and we have to be economical with our words because relationships are built at the speed of trust. Think about it. Do you just invite strangers over to your house? Some of you do. You're weird like that. But how do you, how do you invite somebody over to your house? You take them out on a test. Yeah, you go, you see them in church, you have a conversation after church. Then you take it to a diner. You don't take them to the place that you always go because if that person turns out to be a psycho, they ruin it and you can't go back there. They'll wind up loving it. Every time you go, you got to see that psycho self just sitting there. Hey! You take them to a diner. This way, if they ruin it, you can always find another diner. You can't find another Mama Teresa's. Come on now. And then they pass the diner test, and then you say, all right, well, let's, let's have them over for lunch. Because you don't bring them over for dinner, because if you bring them over for dinner, you got to bring them over to the fine china. So for lunch, we can do it in the backyard, but we won't let them into the main house. Because you know they're going to creep around your bathroom if you let them in. You don't know them yet. And you go to the next step, and the next day, and then eventually you get to the point where, let's, just, let's, let's not invite them just over for any day. Let's invite them over for a holiday. Let's invite them over for Thanksgiving. You know why you invite them over for Thanksgiving? Because you've established trust from previous experience. Are you with me? In business, business moves at the speed of trust. In relationships, relationships move at the speed of trust. The most costly thing to a business, the most costly thing to a relationship is when there is not trust because it slows everything down and it costs more money. And so if we have been called to be as ambassadors, if we have been called to be as representatives, then our main role is establishing trust with the people God has sent us to minister to so that they don't think we're freaks, but they see us as trustworthy servants of the Most High God. And the more they trust us, the more they will listen. But you need to understand, you can't build that trust. It is only the Holy Spirit working through you that can build that trust because it's only the Holy Spirit that knows what to say to their heart that will empower Pack their heart to eventually allow the guard of their heart to come down so you could speak into their heart. If relationships build at the speed of trust, then who are we to think that we can be, we can be so creative in our minds to bridge a gap with a community that we don't know, with people who we don't know? That's why we have to understand that in a conversation, you know, when I say, okay, there are some people, they talk to Jesus more than Moses. Like, you haven't met some people. I was in the prayer closet this morning, and the Lord said to me. I was on the Van Wick Expressway, and the Lord was saying this to me. I was home, and I was watching Jeopardy. And what is the Lord said to me? You know? <laughs> Have you met somebody? It's like God's talked to them 17 times in one day. I'm not going to discount it because I'm not going to be critical of people. But, man, when I think about how much God got from Mo Moses gave to God and how much God gives to me, I'm like, man, that person's on a, on a separate frequency. Yeah, W-C-R-A-Z-Y. Okay, no, just kidding. <laughs> when I say be led by the spirit of your conversations, it doesn't mean we throw away who we are. Do you realize you could be at a Met game, but your conversation still be sanctioned by the Holy Spirit? Do you realize you could be at a party, but your conversation still has to be sanctioned by the Holy Spirit? Although if you go to a wedding... I don't understand why the music is so loud that you can't talk to the people around the table. 
then make the table shorter and give us telephones or teach us sign language. But, I mean, you got us around table nine. It's eight miles long. You got the music playing. You got some guy in a cowbell. And you're like, pleased to meet you. Anyway, that's my own thing. You'll get that later. But you understand what I'm saying? Jesus must be present in every conversation you have because I'm going to tell you something. There's been times I've been talking. Like I'm talking to John. Just an example. This is a fictitious story. Okay? And then we're talking about, hey, hey John, how you doing, man? Yeah. And then John asked me, have you seen Daniela? Go ahead. Have you seen Daniela? You know, I haven't seen Daniela. I haven't seen Daniela in a long time. I think, she, I think, I think there's something up with her. You know, not, right? How many people know? I, I don't, I don't, hold on, I gotta pull up my pants. Can I do that? As you can tell, I'm not the skinny guy that started in 2020. All right. But have you ever been in a conversation and all of a sudden you get that desire to speak something that you know is not quite right? You know it's a little gossipy and you feel that check in your spirit and you know you shouldn't say it. And you dance around it, right? And then he brings up Danielle again. Yeah, you know, she'd been quite, quite peculiar. She'd been quite, you know. And I, I start, stop listening to the Holy Spirit, and then I go full on in a conversation that I'm not supposed to be having. And little do I know, because now I'm, I'm not listening to the Holy Spirit. I'm not listening to the direction. He's really close to Daniela. And you know what he's going to say? Man, Pastor Dom was frying you up like a sizzling before. You know, I can't believe he said that about you. And what does it do? It breaks trust. And when you have no trust, you have no credibility. And is she ever going to, or is he ever going to build, is he ever going to receive not only my ministry, but the Holy Spirit working through me to him? Do you realize when we speak outside of the will of God in our life, that we ruin our credibility to reach people with the gospel? That's why we have to be wise. Now, once again, this is perfectly a Holy Spirit. Con John, how you doing? How's the kids? Great. How's your wife? Awesome. Man, what's going on with the guitar? What have you been playing lately? A lot of jazz. That's demonic. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No. Okay, see, that's where I veered again. You have to be cognizant of the Holy Spirit that you can have a casual conversation, but you got to be guarded that you don't take the bait of the enemy to go any place that conversation should not go. Because all of our conversations should be God-honoring. And there could be a point in a conversation where you're not the one talking smack. Right? Now, John starts talking smack. Pick anybody. Go ahead. Name somebody. Uh, Usher. Yeah. Usher, the, the, the recording artist? Sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. We'll just say Susie. We'll just say Susie. Okay. Just talk, start talking smack about Susie. Susie, uh, she took one of my dishes, and uh, she stole the recipe from me, and she is a horrible cook. Okay, good. Great. Way to go down that road. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You did good. He did good, man. He didn't know. Yeah. It's yes and. Okay, good. But here's the deal. How many times has somebody been talking smack to you about somebody, and you just sit there and don't do anything about it? Or how many times has somebody been talking divisively about the church or about the things of the church, and you just sit there and do nothing about it? Or sometimes you join in. What does that say about us to the, to the world? And so if John is saying, Susie sold my plate, then I need to realize a discipleship moment needs to come in, and I have to be led by the Holy Spirit to say, oh, man, well, John, have you, have you talked to Susie about the plate? Have you asked her about the plate? Right? And then, and then he's like, no, I haven't. Well, how come you haven't asked her about the plate? Well, maybe you should ask her about the plate. Maybe clear this up because you and Susie are on the worship team, and you, you guys need – you understand what I'm saying? Do you know why we have so much church dysfunction? Because sheep stay silent. They don't listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit because you need to understand that there is a point to correct somebody in love. But only correction done of the Holy Spirit in love is the correction that will last. Correction tried in the flesh to try and curb somebody will not last, but when you're led by the Spirit, you'll be able to speak and people will listen. Come on now. Your conversations have to be guided by the Holy Spirit. He is not outside of anything. Now, Acts 2, 38 to 41. Let's read it together. Are you with me? Acts 2, 38 to 41. Peter replied, let's put it there. Peter replied, repent 
and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all who the Lord our God will call. With many of the words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. When you, now, if you read the in-between of that passage, we can see that Peter was being criticized, and also people were inquiring. And Peter stood up in that day, and he gave one of the most amazing sermons that the world has ever seen. This is the same Peter that denied Jesus three times. This is the same Peter that chopped off the guard's ear. This is the same Peter that, 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 that you know what I mean, that Jesus had to say, do you love me, right? And so this is the Peter who was voted the most likely to put his foot in his mouth, the most likely to destroy and blow up the church, the most likely to be thrown out of a baseball game. I don't know, but whatever the case is, right? But, but Peter, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, was able to move outside of his history and move into destiny and he preached the word that 3,000 men were saved in addition to that innumerable women and children because in that scripture they only counted the men so 3,000 men without women and children so over 3,000 people, let's just say 6,000 plus people, get saved on that day because one person spoke under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. People said he was drunk. He didn't say, well, let me show you who's drunk. People said he was crazy. He didn't respond to his critics. He spoke under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and 6,000 plus people were saved. And you know what the Bible says? He also says, repent. Repent. He boldly said under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, repent. And I'm going to tell you something. You've got to get it out of your mindset that the church should not be heralds of repentance. That the church should be ones that will stand up against injustice and that will stand up against sinful behavior. But here's the deal. You must be led by the Spirit that when you stand up for something, it's because the Spirit is telling you to stand up for something. That when you stand against something, it's because the Spirit of God is telling you to stand against something. But under the power of the Holy Spirit, he preached repentance, and the hearts were convicted, and they turned their hearts to God. There are people in your life that the Holy Spirit wants to use you so that you'll not just help them get through a time, but you need to have help bring them to repentance, and the Holy Spirit will give you knowledge. Now, when you walk in the Spirit, here's four things, and we'll, we'll close. When you walk in the Spirit, number one, people see Jesus. When you walk in the Spirit, people see Jesus, and they don't see you. How many people you want people to see Jesus? If you're his ambassador, people need to see Jesus. When people see the fruit of the Spirit, turn me to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians is by revelation. Take a left. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and following. It says this. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit. Did you notice that? For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit. How many people could say that you, all, you know what it's like to walk in the Spirit, but you also know that the flesh is crying out for you to do something that's contrary? Come on. Anybody here ever wake up in the flesh? Anybody here remove in the flesh? Anybody here ever battle the flesh? I battle it all day. My Lord, first service, I mentioned Yankee fans will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And the Lord had to, I had to deal with my flesh, you know. But it says, for the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. Listen to this, they are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, 
uh, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Now, once again, we see the apostle Paul speaking to the church of Galatia under the anointing of the Holy Spirit to call out sin for what it is. It is sin. Amen? But understand this. If you're going to call out sin, if you're going to preach against sin, if you're going to speak to somebody about sin, make sure it's under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and not your flesh. Because we do more damage to that person when we do it in the flesh. When you listen to the Spirit, it's timely because the Spirit's timing is perfect. And I want to walk by the Spirit. I never want my timing to be outside of God's timing. It may be right in the Word, but the timing may not be right for that person. And if relationships are built on trust, I have to have the Spirit help open doors for me so that I can get to a point where I can speak into somebody's life. Evangelism is not instant. Discipleship is not instant. It's a lifelong journey. So now it says this, but the fruit of the Spirit, let's read it together, verse 22. Come on, help me out now, I'm getting tired. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have been crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Amen. When we live in the Spirit, we manifest the fruit of the Spirit. I want you to write this down. You cannot have fruit without intimacy. You cannot have fruit without intimacy. Jesus said in John chapter 15, it says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear much fruit. He also says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will have fruit that will last, right, to my Father's glory. You cannot have the fruit of the Spirit without an abiding relationship with Jesus, his word, and the Holy Spirit. You must embrace and enjoy and abide and depend on his word through prayer and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. You cannot have fruit without intimacy. And the fruit of the Spirit, how many people know you can fake love? Huh? You can fake love. How many times have you said to somebody, I love you, but you really didn't love them? We just love you guys. No, you don't. Shut up. Right? Come on. How many, how many times has somebody said they love you and you're like, you're so full of everything right now that is ungodly? Come on. Has anybody ever told you that they love you but you knew it was, it was a lie? We throw around that love. So you can fake love. You can fake love by taking somebody out for the greatest dinner, by providing them everything that they need. But, but eventually, if you're not empowered by the Spirit, that love will fall apart and show itself for what it really is. We can say we love this community. We can give them food. But if we don't continually go out there and stand in the gap for this community and love them, truly love them like Jesus did unconditionally, that love is only a facade. You can fake love. You can fake joy. You can fake peace. Right? Have you ever told anybody, hey, you okay? Oh, I'm, I'm perfectly fine. I'm perfectly fine. I've never been better. I'm perfectly fine. I'm totally at peace. And then, then when they leave, you're like, ah! <laughs> you can fake peace to all of the people around you, but true peace comes from a place that only can come from intimacy with the Holy Spirit. You can fake patience. You can fake kindness. You can fake goodness. You can... You can try and do faithfulness on your own. You can try to be gentleness. Oh, yeah, and self-control, by the way, self-control is good, but it's like me. Every day I start my diet. Every day I start my diet. Like, yeah, today I'm going to do uh, intuitive eating. Tomorrow I'm going to do uh, intermittent fasting. I'm going to do OMAD. OMAD sounds like a place where they have nuclear weapons, but it means one meal a day. And I'm going to tell you something. When I do that one meal a day stuff, I wait until like 5, 6 o'clock when I come home from work to eat. And then like 9, 10, 11 o'clock, if the Mets have lost, I'm downstairs in the refrigerator eating my OMAD leftovers. (laughs) 
you can try self-control. You could try not to touch pornography. You could try not to curse. You could try not to be divisive. You could try not to gossip. But only until you surrender to the Lord and you allow that intimacy with the Holy Spirit to take place, then you will truly have love. Then you will truly have joy. Then you will truly have peace. And when people see you, you don't have to say, I'm a peaceful person. They'll know by your fruit. The only way you can show the fruit of the Spirit is to abide in the Holy Spirit. And here's the four things. When you walk in the Holy Spirit, people see Jesus. If he's lifted up, he will draw all people unto him. We need to understand that we just don't want to show Jesus on Sunday in the church. Do people know that you serve Jesus outside of this church? Number two. When you walk in the spirit, write this down, not everyone will understand you, and some might even mock you. And the flesh will try and rise up because nobody wants to be mocked. Do you like to be mocked? Do you like to be made fun of? I could tell you this. I had to take a guy who was high on drugs to a teen challenge. I was a youth pastor, right in the sanctuary. He had a bag of clothes, and uh, that was all. And he used this church as a means to really try and get with his wife before he went to rehab, right? So, like, one hour passes, he's not leaving with me. Two hour passes, he's not leaving with me. I start to get impatient with the guy. He starts to get impatient with me. Long story short, he curses me out in this sanctuary. And as much as I was trying to walk in the spirit, I walked outside and said, now get out of here before I call the cops. He started cursing me out more. As he cursed me out more like an Olympic, uh, you know, discus. I had his bag of clothes right there in the parking lot. I feel like he was up top of the hill side edge. He's one of my greatest moments of ministry. I took the bag and I went like this and I chucked it over the fence right in the middle of Hillside Avenue, right in front of the Q43. It stayed there for 24 hours. <laughs> and I told the guy to get out of the church because I wasn't led by the Spirit. Because I let my flesh in my... Some of you are like, I can't, I'm not coming to church next week. Oh, yeah, I seen you on the Van Wick Expressway. You did worse than that. <laughs> but do you understand how I allowed my flesh to fight a battle that I didn't need to fight? Now, he may have been wrong, and he may, it may have not been the right time for him to go to Teen Challenge. But we never saw that family again. All because I wanted to be an Olympic shop putter of somebody's laundry. And defend myself because somebody said, F you. Right? So a little bit of my flesh overwhelmed the spirit. Anybody ever been there? Come on, make me feel good. Make me feel good. Come on, come on. What about you, Alco? Yeah, he was without sin, cast the first bag of laundry. Okay, good. <laughs> when you walk in the Spirit, it, it, is it is possible to start off in the Spirit and then end up in the flesh. When you walk in the Spirit, not everyone will understand you, nor, nor will they validate you. And the truth is, walking in the Spirit, you have to crucify the flesh, and you have to say, God, my emotions, my reputation... My physical well-being is all in your care. And God, I will only say what you want me to say. And that's hard. And the only way you can get there is by abiding in his presence. Because the only way you can walk in his character is to understand his character by sitting in his character. I got a roll. Ready? Write this down. Luke 12, 11, and 12. Okay. Write those scriptures down. I know there's a reason I told you that. But you have to understand that there is also a time to fight, okay? But the battle belongs to the Lord. And if you fight without the authority of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, then you will lose. It's like what Moses says, Lord, if you don't go with us, we will not go. Number three, when you walk in the Spirit, your character reflects his. Therefore, your words must also be like his as well. In, Luke, in John chapter 12, verses 49 to 50, Jesus says, 
that he only says what the Father gives him permission to say. In John 16, 12 through 15, the Holy Spirit says that he only speaks what the Father tells him he needs to speak. Therefore, if Jesus only speaks what God gives him permission to, and the Holy Spirit only speaks what Jesus gives him permission to, and the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to take the things of Jesus and reveal them to us, why are we above Jesus and God that fall in that order that they only speak what they are permitted to speak about and yet we feel we can post on social media, say whatever we want, we can be political and we can be biblical at the same time, which is an oxymoron. You understand what I'm saying? Why is it that we circumvent this process and we could speak for ourselves, we could defend ourselves and we could we can vindicate ourselves, but here's the deal. You can only speak what the Holy Spirit gives you permission to speak. Point in case, I could have posted something online this weekend. I am pro-life. I am pro-Mets. I am pro a lot of things. And, and I felt like, okay, am I supposed to just post something because every other pastor is posting something? And the Holy Spirit says, no, you're going you're gonna to say what I want you to say. Because here's the deal. I am pro-life, and I am grateful for the prayers that overturn and, and, and that are standing up for the sanctity of life. Praise God. But I also know, check this out now, that there are people that are devastated this morning, that there are people that are scared this morning, that there are people that, that, that don't understand the Imago Dei, which is that we are all made in the image of God. And my post doing a victory lap... And I'm not saying anyone who did this is wrong, but I'm just saying for Dominic Cotignola, just because everyone's doing it, the Spirit of God is telling me it's not me. Now, although I support the decision and I'm grateful, here's the deal. A law of legislation never changed the heart of anybody. And if you think that a changing of the law is going to change the hearts of people, let me ask you something. Did the overturning of Roe versus Wade change the heart of people that were for abortion? It only made them angrier. So then what are we to do? Just gloat about it? Or are we to go to them and love them and show them the fruit of the Spirit and speak the gospel to them and embrace them and talk with them and allow the Holy Spirit to give us the words to say so that they will understand that in Jesus Christ there is hope. That in Jesus Christ there is life. That they too were made in the image of God. That Jesus died on the cross for them. Do you understand that, that we have an obligation not just to, just to post up the fact that things happen and we won. We have an obligation to go to the people who don't feel the same way we do and speak the gospel to them. Because if we don't, they'll die. We truly believe in the sanctity of life. We also should believe in the promise of eternal life. And we should also be compelled that those that don't have it are going to die. And if we don't send them, who will? You've been called to be the watchman of the city. And I don't want the people's blood in our hands in a 20-mile radius. There are Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs and Jews and Christians that are not in church right now that need Jesus. And unless we speak the Holy Spirit to them and the Holy Spirit guides our words, our actions, and our activities, they will not know. That's why it's so important in this season that you are the mouthpiece of God. Because God wants to raise up a prophetic generation in these last days. And mark my words, read your Bible. We're living in the last days. And I don't want to be the church that was asleep. And I don't want to be the believer that didn't take God seriously. And I also realize because we don't have a lot of time left. Look, I can say this because Dominic's not in the room. He'll get nervous when I say this. But let me gravitate back to some 1980s preaching. The trumpet could sound at any minute. Do you agree? I thought it was bad in the 80s and the 90s. And like the Cold War, we'd all blow up and that would be the Armageddon. Def Leppard, good song, Armageddon. It. That was for you in the alcove, Def Leppard. But the trumpet could sound. I don't want to be building Dom's kingdom or the kingdom of Belrose. I want to get back out there and start to go fishing. Because when you walk in the spirit, here's number four. You walk in boldness. 
Jesus said in Luke 4, 18, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to set the captive free. And he was quoting Isaiah 61, 1, which he was the fulfillment of that prophecy. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is in you and on you. And he's anointed you to preach good news. I pray you bring people to church. And we're going to pray, and people are going to get saved at these altars. And this church will always be a lighthouse. But I pray the greatest ministry we see is outside the walls of this church. If you're timid and scared to speak your faith and to share about Jesus in public, that's why he gave you the Holy Spirit, to empower you to do something you cannot do on your own. I could do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I pray the greatest miracles that would happen I pray great things would happen in this church, but do you understand this church was never meant to be the place of the greatest miracles? The greatest miracles were supposed to happen in the highways and the byways, like Peter, when he was on his way into the temple, he said to a crippled man, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give to thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Here's the deal. When I make kingdom business my business, then everything else that I have in my purview is taken care of. When kingdom business is not my priority, I've got to work harder to keep what I've made my, my business. When kingdom business is not your priority, you will work harder than you ever have to work. You will struggle to keep what you've already tried to establish. You understand what I'm saying? When you live for the kingdom, God honors you in your workplace, in your vocation. When you are about your father's business, he touches every area of your life. When you're not about your father's business, it's all about what you can get. You struggle and you work harder to keep what you've been holding on to with a death grip. But if you seek first his kingdom and you walk in the power of his spirit... God will use you mightily in these last days. And by the way, he'll take care of your needs. Because some of you be saying, and I'll just say it. Some of you be saying, well, I came to church, you know, I needed something. I needed a joyous message. I needed to be lifted up. I'm a little down this week. You know what will solve your depression issues? Get busy for Jesus. You know what will solve your health issues? Get busy for Jesus. Because God, when God knows he can trust you with his resources and his word and his mission, then don't you think he's going to take care of you? That's why I believe. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. I, I can't tell you enough. You've got to start to fall in love with him and his word and his mission. Because if not, we're just playing church and we're not being faithful. And I don't want to be the church that when the next pandemic comes, we lose another third because we just made attenders and not disciples. Disciples are in love with Jesus. They follow his word. They're empowered by the spirit. And they make more disciples. It's time to make disciples. And the great part is he's giving you the Holy Spirit. It's foolproof plan. IBM, you work for IBM, they'll give you a computer. They'll give you training. But when you work for the kingdom of God, he gives you a piece of him. He gives you his presence inside of you and his power inside of you. Do you realize if we got serious about it, there would not be a church big enough to hold the people that you and I could minister to empowered by the Holy Spirit? In one day, three to 6,000 got saved. What would happen just in one week if all of us said, Holy Spirit, use us in our context and help us build trust and relationship and sow seeds into people's lives so that they can know Jesus. Go and make disciples.